So, how many of you would say that you love the idea of work? Uh, feel free to do a show of hands. How many of you, when you hear about the concept of work, think, yeah, I really want to go and do some of that? Well, okay, so that's a good point. But there's about half of you, and the people who, like me, are lucky enough to work in promoting objectivism, maybe frame that question as how many of you loved the idea of work before you started doing that? Because I think that those of us who have the fortune of doing that have a slightly different perspective. So this might be work in a school context or work in an employment context, depending where you are in life. But I think a lot of us have a reaction to work, a kind of hatred of the concept that goes back a long way into our past. So when I was young, when I was at high school, a little younger than I think a lot of you are now, I absolutely hated the idea of work. I saw work as something that other people make me do. Whether that's at school, where teachers were telling me to learn things I wasn't interested in, work hard on exams and, and projects that had no, held no interest to me at all, or whether it was my family at home telling me to do chores. I, I divided everything in life into one of two camps when I was a child. I either saw things as work that people made me do or fun that I enjoyed doing. So it didn't matter what the thing was or how much effort I was putting into it. It was either fun if I enjoyed it or it was work if I didn't. Now, I had a lot of goals when I was young. From the earliest days, I, I had an inc incredible amount of optimism and ambition. When I was a kid, I wanted to be the first child in space. Then when I was older, I had dreams of starting an airline. Eventually, that became a bus company. It, gradually, the ambition toned down. But I always had goals and dreams. I wanted to become a musician, a rock star. But I had no sense of the amount of work that would need to be done in order to do that. I didn't even think of those things as work. I thought of them as things that I would enjoy doing and I would just do because they're fun. And that attitude carried through into a lot of my hobbies and a lot of my activities. When I was a teenager, I, I started playing guitar and teaching myself electric guitar. And I started making music. And frankly, it was terrible. It was some of the worst music that has ever been made. But I, did, I had no concept of the fact that I needed to work hard in order to achieve that, that goal of becoming a musician. I thought I could just start it, do it, and maybe one day I will have the lucky encounter that means that people start recognizing how amazing it is. It really wasn't. And, um, and I also, I wanted the good life. I've always had this desire to be wealthy, to have a house in the countryside. I think many of us do. But I had no sense of how you get there. I thought you're, you're either lucky enough to be born into that kind of wealth and fortune, or you're lucky enough to have that chance encounter that leads to it. You, you win the lottery, or you meet somebody who gives you a job and you earn a ton of money. And otherwise, you're, you're either lucky or you're not, and you, you just have a normal job and a normal life like everybody else does. Now, I maintained that mindset right the way through university. So I went to university in 2009, which was right after the 2008 financial crisis. So my professors, I was doing music at university, and they were telling me that the, this, this crisis has happened. Nobody's spending money for pleasure anymore. Nobody's buying CDs anymore. There's no money. There's no jobs in the music industry. So our professors were literally telling us, when you finish your degree, you can either go work in a restaurant or you can stay at university. There's nothing else to do. And so, and I, I hated the idea of, of doing what I saw as a normal job. I still had this concept of work left over from school, that work is something that's imposed on me by society or by others. I had no desire to do that. But at the same time, I had this very, what Rand would call second-handed idea that I needed to impress my family and friends. I needed to be doing something with my life that was, was that I could be proud of in front of others, that I, could, I shouldn't be ashamed of. So how do I avoid work and nevertheless keep impressing people? Well, my plan was to just stay at university. I, wanted to be, I, was, I was on track to be the eternal student, and I, I went through into a master's degree, uh, and then I carried on and started a PhD program. Wasn't really terribly interested in what I was doing, but it enabled me to maintain this situation of avoiding work whilst also keeping other people happy. Now, that wasn't very sustainable, and clearly I was going to have to make a decision at one point. And I was rather fortunate in the sense that I came across Ayn Rand's ideas while I was starting out on that, well, finishing the master's and starting out on the PhD. And Rand introduced me to a completely new concept, which is the idea that 
it's moral for me to want to pursue my own happiness. And the, one of the ways I do that is by being productive. So uh, the first thing I saw, actually, of Rand's was the Mike Wallace interview that um, I think Martin played a clip from yesterday, where she immediately starts out by saying, reason is our way of living, and our own happiness, a person's own happiness, is his moral purpose in life. And, and that resonated with me and, and made me realize suddenly that there, there is no distinction between work and and enjoyment, that I can, I can hybridize the two and I can, I can work for my enjoyment. I'll read out a quick quote um, from Rand. The, the message that really resonated with me was, she says, the moral purpose of a man's life is the achievement of his own happiness. And then she went on to say, the virtue of productiveness is the recognition of the fact that productive work is the process by which man's mind sustains his life, the process that sets man free of the necessity to adjust himself to his background, as all animals do, and gives him the power to adjust his background to himself. Now that resonated with me particularly because I've always loved technology. I've always loved cities. I love the way that human beings reshape our environment to survive. I'd never thought of applying that to personal life, to the idea that I can reshape my environment to further my flourishing on an individual level as well. So I, st I came to begin, I started to see work as the means of achieving a better life instead of the choice. Instead of there's a choice between a happy life and working, I started to see working as the route to a happy life. So I want to try and first analyze why I think a lot of people make the mistake I made of seeing work and enjoyment as two separate things. And I think that's because, on the one hand, work in common parlance, at least in, in Britain and America, and I think it's probably true in a lot of countries, um, the abstraction of work gets frozen at the level of employment. Now, if anyone wasn't in the talk yesterday where frozen abstractions were defined, so that's when a concept doesn't make it all the way up to the... So where somebody freezes a concept prior to completing it, like the example that was given yesterday was freezing the concept of morality at the level of altruism. So you, you use a part of the concept to represent the entire concept. I think a lot of people do that with work. They say work, and what they mean is job or employment. They mean a traditional nine to five office job or a restaurant job or a retail job, a typical normal job, the kind of job that school sets you up for. And the truth is that employment is one form of work, and there are many forms of work. In fact, really, there are far more forms of work than people generally realize. Work is a concept that comes indirectly from physics. In physics, work is the amount of energy that something transfers to another object in order to make that other object move. And I think that's a useful analogy for work in the human sense. Work is the productive effort that human beings do to achieve something out there in the real world. So just as when an engine pushes a heavy load and it does work to make the heavy load mood, move, whenever a human being does something to affect change in the world around him or her, uh, that is also work. So work is much broader than just employment. It's also much broader than just productive effort to earn money. It's all the productive stuff you do. Every time you make something, every time you produce, think, any activity you do that has a productive outcome is a form of work. Now, it's worth noting that that includes hobbies. It includes things that you just do for fun. It's not limited to employment. But... It is a reality that you have to do work in life, and that's not a reality that's forced on you by other people. As a, that was the way I saw it at school. I saw that other people make me work, and I have to because society expects it. And that's not true. The reason we have to do work is that in order to survive, we need to produce values. And sometimes that's in a direct, obvious way, like if you're living in the wild, you need to create food, and sometimes that's in a less direct way in a civilized society where you need to produce value to trade with other people so that they can give you the values you need to survive. Now, so productive effort in work is any kind of productive effort, essentially, that re results in some kind of product. So I, I've, in a sense, in the last 10 years, come to see the separation of work and non-work the other way around from how I saw them before. So whereas previously I only saw work as things that people make me do that I don't want to do, now I see work as anything that produces a product for me or improves my life. And I've come around to seeing 
activity that doesn't produce a product as not being work. So there are a lot of jobs that people do that really have no product at the end of them. Government jobs is the obvious example where you know, somebody's job is just to endlessly create paperwork and, and never produce real value. Like that's, a, that's completely unproductive. I would actually say that doesn't count as work because it doesn't produce net value. You're, you're just expending energy uselessly. And in a similar sense, if you're doing a job or doing work, even if it's in an educational setting, that isn't serving your long-term values, that isn't actually about improving your life, I don't think that's really working in a meaningful sense. I think it only becomes work in the truest sense of the word when it's being productive and serving your ultimate goals in life. Now, if any of you have read Atlas Shrugged, I know I think about half of you probably have, then there's a, there's a short scene in Atlas Shrugged where Dagny Taggart steps out of a building and observes the people around her and remarks on how people when they're being productive, have a certain attitude that she admires, even when they're not doing the kind of amazing work she does. And she remarks on what she calls the, uh, what Rand called, describes as an expertly steered bus. She sees a bus driver rounding a corner and marvels at how precisely and carefully the, the bus driver steers the bus. And, and that's a good example of how you can have pride in work, even if your work isn't earth-shattering and transformative. So, Productive work comes on all sorts of levels, everything from cleaning the dishes through to curing a disease. Like the, the, that whole, whole spectrum of productive work is worthy of taking pride in if it's serving your values and your goals. And then the bus driver example resonated with me particularly because I have a number of friends through my interest in transportation who are bus drivers and absolutely love that job. And, and I've seen the expertly steered bus for myself. I have seen people passionately drive buses. And I've seen a lot of people driving buses and doing that kind of work who clearly don't enjoy it, clearly hate it. People who you, you get on the bus and you say, you know, I want to go here. And the person's just like, oh, okay. And you know, honks at the cars and clearly hates his life. But I've seen the opposite where people love it because they found the form of work that really resonates with their values that they can really feel fulfilled doing. Now... That's, that kind of pride comes from when the work you're doing, as I said, is, is in sync with your values. It won't come when the work you're doing is out of a sense of obligation. So between my university studies, I worked for a while in a video game shop. And I used to get frustrated. This is before I understood the proper, the proper meaning of work. At the time, my bosses at the shop store, even though they knew I was only going to be there until I went back to university, they had this sense that I should be developing a career in retail, and they wanted me to put my 100% of my effort into this sort of monotonous job where I was just selling, and buy, selling video games to people. And my heart wasn't in it at all. My brain was somewhere else the entire time. And, and I found it really frustrating. And what I realize now is that I hadn't connected that job to my values in any, on any level. I, I liked video games, but that was about the extent of it. I didn't particularly like most of the ones I was selling. So that disconnect meant that I didn't invest in the job, and I didn't even see it as a source of income to grow my life. Because at the time, I was still living with my family, and I was there because my mom had told me, you need to make some money while you're on holiday. I wasn't there because I realized I needed to make some money to sustain my life. So you can do a job you don't enjoy, but if you know you're doing it to develop your life, you can get a lot more value and a lot more sense of pride from it than if you're doing it out of a sense of obligation. And that goes for all kinds of work. Like, if you're doing something for a family member who you don't particularly care about, you're going to put a lot less effort into it than if you're doing it for someone you love and care about out of that love and care. So I would have a different attitude to that job now if, if I knew I was doing it for a good reason. And a good example of that is it's perfectly rational, I think, and sensible to do a job you don't like in the short term in order to give yourself the resources to pursue the career you want to pursue in the long term. So if you want to start a business or something like that, you want to build up an intellectual career, it makes complete sense to do a boring, monotonous job at the same time to develop the money to enable you to do that. But what you shouldn't do, what I would advise against doing, which is what I've seen so many of my friends do back home, is settle for, well, not just for second best, settle for something you don't care about at all because that's what society expects, that you do the nine to five and... Uh, 
our friends back in England are what I like to call our normie friends, like the people who aren't at all in the political or philosophic circles, just regular people. Uh, of the group I know in my hometown, I can only think of one person who enjoys his job. Uh, everybody else in that group, they do accountancy, they do standards reinforcement, whatever that is, they, uh, they do all sorts of just things that, they, they have that work fun separation that I had at school. A lot of people continue that into their adult lives. They, they work nine to five, they hate it, they, try, they wait for the end, you, you hear it all the time, nothing like, you know, what's it, Friday, got to get down on Friday, Friday, yay, can't wait till the weekend, dreading Monday, Wednesday's the worst day of the week because you're as far from the fun period as you can be. You, you hear this kind of stuff from people all the time. They hate half of their lives and they spend the other half trying to forget the half they hate. They, they're watching TV shows. I, I remember this. I had it with, with somebody I was in a relationship with before. Like every evening was just films and TV shows and any way of escaping the reality of hating work. So why do people do that? Well, I think a lot of it comes down to this concept that you'll, you'll have heard called work-life balance. And I think that it's a, an invalid concept, and I'll explain why. So... Work that is understood properly, like I said before, is in line with your values. The, the values that you want to live by, the things that you care most about, the things that are integral to your life. So work, when it's done properly, when it's properly understood, is your life. It's what you live and breathe. So I now work promoting objectivism, which I, I'm promoting the values I live by, the values that have transformed my life. But even the job I did before that, when I was working in urban design, I was working in a field that I absolutely loved, that I cherished, that I enjoyed. So my work was completely synced up with my life, and there was no work-life separation. Now, I think that what people are doing here is, again, freezing the abstraction of work at the level of employment. They mean, work em they mean employment life balance. How much time are you spending on your job versus how much time are you spending at home? But that distinction falls apart when your job is actually in sync with your values and in sync with the things you would choose to do even if you didn't have to work. So I think the, the legitimate concept that work-life balance is sitting in the place of is work-rest balance. Because in order to live healthily, in order to be physically and mentally healthy, and in order to be productive and to work well, you need rest. So I like to use the example of our cat at home. If any of you own a cat, cats spend inordinate amounts of time sleeping. If, if, if anyone's lived with a cat, they, they cannot sit still for five minutes without falling asleep. And the reason for that is that cats, despite the fact that we keep them for their cute, cuddly qualities, are actually fierce killing machines. And in the wild, they, their natural tendency is to store up as much energy as possible so that when they need to hunt, they have this on tap, endless, boundless energy and they can leap onto trees and chase squirrels and whatever they need to do. And that's why they spend so much time asleep is because their natural tendency is to have massive exertions of energy at one time. Now, that's not how human beings live. We, most of our energy goes on running our minds and we do that over a longer period more slowly, but we still need a hell of a lot of energy to do that. And the less rest you get, the less capable of doing that you're going to be, and the more you're going to hurt yourself. So although there are situations in life, I think, where a higher intensity of work is necessary, I don't think it's healthy to do 80-hour weeks all the time. There is a balance between work and rest. And rest doesn't just mean sleeping. It means mental rest as well. It means taking time to watch a movie or taking time to socialize with friends to get for yourself the mental nutrition you need to then be productive the rest of the time. And that's why we have this concept of a sort of 40 hour, 50 hour working week, because human beings need that rest of that time to rest. Now, if you're at a point in life where, you need, where you're trying to start something, like you're starting a business, you're starting a new job, or you have a big project to deliver, it's perfectly valid for a few weeks to let that slip, to suspend that arrangement and go crazy for a while because after doing that, you're going to have a product that's going to make your life better. That's totally valid. But try not to fall into the trap of thinking, because work is life and productive work means so much to me, I'm going to do nothing but. Because you'll end up doing less productive work in the long run. Because your work will be less efficient. You won't be properly rested. If the cat is awake all day long, he's not going to be able to chase his prey very effectively. It's the same thing. You just won't be as effective. Likewise, totally valid to take a few weeks 
some time of the year and do next to no productive work and just go on holiday and relax. Also good for you in the long run, but don't fall into the trap of thinking, I want to spend all of my life doing nothing. And that leads me on to my next thing I want to talk about, which is how you identify what kind of work you want to do. So I like to do an exercise, and if, you, if any of you were in Tbilisi um, in August at Liberty International, you'll have heard me say this before, so apologies for the repetition if you were there. But for the rest of you, I'd like you to try and imagine a scene. Imagine that sometime in the future, you have all the money you could ever need. You have a giant ma mason, that's French. You have a giant mansion in the countryside. You have endless money. You don't need to work for money anymore. What would you do with your time if you had all the money in the world and complete freedom? So if it's tempting, and I, I, I won't insult any of you by telling you that you thought this, but I know I would have thought this, so some of you may well do. If it's tempting to think, oh, I'll just sit back and relax and take baths and watch TV and just play with my dogs in the field and do nothing else, then think how you'd feel after doing that for a few months with having no, nothing to show for all that time. You've just kind of existed but not produced anything. I don't think any of you, the kind of people who would come to this event, would be satisfied with that. I think you would all want more meaning and more satisfaction. So with that in mind, in a world where you had complete endless money and you never needed to work to, to earn a living, what would you do with your time that would make you feel fulfilled? And if you take a moment to think about that, you'll start to get a sense of what your core values are, what the things you care most about are. When I do this exercise, the thing that comes to my mind is that I love producing ideas. I love creating products, not in the sort of factory sense, but in the ideological sense. So I, I love creating stories. I love creating articles. I would ideally love to create film and television. I love looking at something that I've written, and especially if it communicates ideas that I, I like. I love impacting the course of history and making the world more like the kind of world I want to live in. And I also love science and space and aviation and that kind of stuff. So I very quickly come to the realization that I want to work promoting the ideas I like, the civilization and technology and those kinds of things. So this exercise is really helpful for me. Now for you, it might be something totally different. It could be anything from cars to horse racing, to, you know, whatever it is that appeals to you, try and identify that thing. Now, for most of you, probably for all of you, I expect, there'll be multiple answers to this. I, as I said before, I also love urban design. I love buildings, architecture. I could be quite happy in those fields. So it becomes a question of which of those things are you most interested in? My wife, for example, does the same job I do now. She and I both love promoting rational ideas, but she also loves plants, and she could just as easily have pursued a career in horticulture and gardening, um, which might have been a little less fulfilling, but still would have made her very happy. So get a sense of your, what we call a value hierarchy. What things matter more and matter less to you, and which of these things would give you the most fulfillment if you pursued them? Now, and, and this overlaps with what Angel was saying in her talk, that in order to be able to say, I love you, you need to be able to say the I. That's also true in order to be able to say, I love this, you need to be able to say the I. You need to know what you value before you can know what you want to do, what's going to give you fulfillment. And it's very easy to, and I think a lot of people do, substitute the short-term pleasures, the things that are just fun, for the things that are actually meaningful in the long term. So... I, I wanted to quickly talk about the fact that in order to, uh, one, one of the reasons we need to work is to sustain our lives, but there are also several other reasons that work is really important to us. And um, one of the most important is self-esteem, that in order to feel proud of ourselves, in order to look in the mirror and say, this is somebody who I'm impressed with and proud of, we need to be productive and that's a virtuous cycle. The more good work you do, the more you produce, the more you feel capable of doing good work. And I've seen this in my job in the last three years. The, the better my writing's got, the more I felt able to do more writing. The better my speaking's got, the more I've been it, felt able to do more speaking, and so on and so forth. And pride is one of the most important va values uh, in, in human life, the ability to look at yourself and look at your life and be proud of it. And then there's also that sense of meaning. There's that sense that you're doing something that matters. So 
working is important for your own life. And as I was saying earlier, although you don't need to work for others, you don't need to work because other people expect it, you should work for yourself, you do necessarily need to trade with others in order to get the things you, need, you want in life. So once you've done that exercise and identified your core values, try and see it like a Venn diagram. You have the circle of things you like doing over here, and then you have the circle of things that other people are willing to pay you for over here. And the trick to finding the right job is to find the intersection of those two circles. Now, hopefully, there will be a fairly large intersection, but if you have some very niche interests, like unfortunately I do, there's going to be large chunks of things over here that nobody's particularly interested in paying you for, and large chunks of things over here that you're never going to want to do. So trying to find that lovely diamond-shaped golden area in between is the key to finding a good job. Now, there are lots of ways to monetize specific things, and we can talk about this in the Q&A if you want. But generally, the more niche and un unusual the thing you want to monetize is, the harder it's going to be. But the more mainstream it is, probably the less fulfilling it's going to be. So trying to find that intersection is, is a really important stage. And um, it's, uh, you can, after you've done this process and after you've started down the track, it's important as well to just regularly check that you are in the right field, you are doing the right thing. And one of the ways of doing that is seeing if the work you're doing excites you enough to get you into a flow state and, and make you feel creative. So if, if you're in a job which you thought when you were younger was going to be meaningful and, and important to you, and then you're struggling to get excited about it, that's a bad sign. Whereas if you're doing something like you, you decide to do some writing, you decide to go and try a hobby, and you get into a state where you feel super creative and you don't want to stop, that's a good indicator that you're on the right track. And I've had this experience myself. When I was a teenager, I was convinced that I wanted to be a scientist. And I thought that physics was the thing that I would do for my whole life. And I still love science. I'm absolutely fascinated by science. But it turns out I'm terrible at math, or maths, depending which version of English you use. And, um, and I, I just, the, the abstractness of it, the disconnection from physical reality that all of that mathematics represented made it completely uninteresting to me. So when I actually discovered what working in science is really like, I was not at all interested. And I had a similar experience with music, that I love listening to music, I love playing music, but I can't stand the music industry uh, or music academia and the, and the kind of mindset that, that's prevalent there. So it, it was my third and fourth careers, really, that actually became the ones that were right for me. It took me a number of times to, to do that. And I, I, I don't know if it's the same in, in all, of these, all of the countries that you've come from, but certainly in England and I know in America, we have these things at school called careers advisors or careers days, career days, where somebody comes into school when you're 17 years old and says, what are you going to do for the rest of your life? And, and everyone goes, oh, I don't know. And you know, maybe a few people have an idea. Maybe a few people have a crazy dream from their childhood that they dig up and offer as an answer. Fireman, astronaut, something. Actually, not that crazy a dream if you're serious about it. But you know, they're probably not terribly well thought through. Most people have no idea what they want to do at that age. And yet, we have a system that expects you to know at that age and, and tries to force you down a, a given track from, from the age of 18. The reality is that for a lot of us, we won't know until we're in our mid-20s or even early 30s what our actual calling is. Some people will be even later than that. So be prepared for the reality that your desires, your interests will change over time and that it will take you a long time to figure out what the best thing is for you. Don't expect the thing you start at to be the right thing straight away. I, I found that particularly in the last couple of decades, since it's been popular to support the idea that everybody should go to university. A lot of people go to university, study a given subject, and then do something completely different in their real life. And again, looking at my friends at back home, of the ones I know, maybe about 10 to 20% actually work in the field they studied at university. Most of them did university because they thought they had to, or because they thought they'd be left behind if they didn't and then ended up doing a completely different job afterwards because they hadn't done that exercise of identifying what they really care about. So going back for a moment to the idea of sort of a, a, a good life where there is no work, where you can just rest and relax, 
That, as I said, would be rather unfulfilling. And I think this is a good example of the fact that when you achieve your goals and when you find the right thing, that doesn't mean you'll have a life with no effort. And I don't think that's even desirable. And I quite like the concept um, that you might have heard called choose your hard, um, which is a slightly confusing use of language, but it basically means choose your difficulty. Choose the, choose the kind of difficulty you're going to have in life. Because the reality of existence, and I don't want to sound nihilistic, like this is actually a good thing, but the reality of existence is that producing and creating always requires a huge amount of effort. But not creating and not producing means either lacking the resources you need to live or lacking the fulfillment that comes from living productively. And those are both hard lives. And the reality in life is that we need to choose one of them. You need to choose the difficulty of working hard or the difficulty of not having meaning. Uh, and so many people choose the latter, and I think the latter is, is worse. I think it's, there, there's a kind of a good hard and a bad hard. I think the bad hard is unfulfillment and meaninglessness and getting to the end of your life and feeling like you've not done anything. And the good hard is the rewarding effort that feels great when you're doing it if you find the right kind of thing to do and feels amazing when you complete it and you can look at a product. And having experienced this a few times now, I can't tell you, if you've not experienced it, just how wonderful it is when you complete a project and get to see the result of it. Um, a couple of weeks ago, my wife and I put on a conference back in England, and we spent months planning and preparing this thing. We had never done anything like it before. And in the days running up to it, we were looking at each other saying, what the hell are we doing? This is insane. There's people flying in from Israel and India to see us put on an event that we've planned. We thought we were crazy, that we were barely staying awake, barely sleeping. And um, you know, we, we, we couldn't believe we were doing this insane amount of planning and effort. And then the day came, and it, it's one of the best days I've ever had. I, I, I enjoyed every moment of it. I, I made amazing connections. And just seeing this dream, which I thought was an unachievable dream of putting on a, an, a science and technology conference in my hometown, with my friends and, and with amazing speakers actually happen. It's just incredible. And it's the, it's the same feeling you get when you write a book and you see the first physical copy of your book and it's actually there in front of you. It's the most phenomenal experience you can enjoy in life. So although effort and work and particularly hard work carry this kind of negative connotation of drudgery and our memories of exams and that kind of thing, it's actually a beautiful process when you do it self-interestedly, when you do it out of a sense of value, and when you get the kind of amazing products that you can get from doing it well. So to summarize, I think that learning to love work is a really key part of enjoying life and getting fulfillment from life. It's a, I, th I think the, the attitude that most people have from work stems back from education fundamentally. And the more I've thought about every problem in our society, from gang violence to our you know, overgrown governments to the quality of television and film, all that kind of thing, all of these problems, the more I think about them, the more they come back to education. They come back to how we raise young people. And if, we need, if we're going to fix this on a global level, if we're going to create a more prosperous, more flourishing future as a society, then we need to fix our education. We need to change how we raise children, and a, a big part of that is separating work from this sort of false concept, this almost anti-concept of employment, job, nine to five, and instead uniting work properly with the concept of life. And the, one of the key concepts here is integration. It's really important to integrate your work into your life and understand that they are one and the same thing. There is no work-life balance. There is a work-life integration. And um, so if any of you have children in the future, or those of you who maybe already do, I think it's really important to not only encourage that, but encourage curiosity and encourage active-mindedness in children. It, it, it makes me so sad, I don't know if you've ever seen in shops or when you're out and about on the train or something, and you see a child saying, what's that, how does that work? And you see a parent or somebody saying, don't ask me stupid questions, I don't know, why do you care? It, I think it's so important to encourage that curiosity, encourage that open-mindedness, active-mindedness, sorry. And that sense of seeing life as beautiful and interesting and as worth putting effort into. And that kind of mindset will encourage the right kind of work. So 
You can really only love life and love other people, I think, if you integrate your work into your life. My wife and I often get asked, how do we survive working together and living together and, and not end up killing each other? And, uh, and the answer is that we're both living for our values. We, we've identified in each other the same core values, and we've identified in our work the same core values. And all of our, all of our life, all of everything we do is built around those core values, which for us in common is curiosity and rationality and a, a, a love of life, a love of, of creativity and productiveness. So try and identify those core values in your life and try to build your life around them on a personal level and on a professional level. So thank you very much. Yeah, um, I, don't, I don't know if that's the right way to look at it, making time to not work. I think it's making time to rest, which you can still, you can rest productively. Like, so I mean, it, what, what, what's your, what is your work? What's the kind of thing you like doing? Uh, beside my job. Yeah, oh, both, either. Well, exactly. So, but I, do you feel like you're working when you play volleyball? No. No. So I, I think it's just a question of balancing the different things you value. Like, get a sense of that hierarchy. Because I don't know about you, but like project management isn't something that excites me and makes me want to sort of get up and go. But I think what you mean is like events that and projects that are meaningful in an, in another sense. So one way to relax, if you're if I don't know philosophy or ideas or whatever the the field is is exciting to you is just to relax and read about those things or watch videos about those things. So you can still do the same subject, the same interest, and progress that thing in a relaxing way. So for example, if I'm you know, completely exhausted from doing too much event planning and writing and editing and that kind of thing, I can just put on a video about philosophy or I can just listen to an audio book, go to the gym and relax. Uh, go to the gym and relax. It might sound a bit strange, but you know, working out is kind of relaxing in a way for me, but also just listening to things and watching things. Um, but then I also have my other values, like I, I love reading about history and that kind of thing. Uh, I love watching, you know, and I, I spend every, not every evening, but quite a lot of time when I've got to the end of the day, I'll just stick on an episode of Buffy the Vampire Slayer and relax that way. And that, that just takes me out of the day for a bit and lets me exist in a, a kind of... A, a, a less focused, less kind of active way. And that, that's just rest for the brain. I, I think the brain needs rest. Um, so, yeah, it's just listening to your body, listening to your mind, realizing when you're exhausted and letting yourself take breaks. And I think a lot of people who are in really productive jobs get into the sense of, oh, if I'm not being productive now, then I'm going to let everything slip. And the reality is sometimes taking that 45 minutes to just watch a, a TV show gives you the energy to use the next hour way more productively than you would have used the two hours if you hadn't taken the break. So, yeah, it's, it's just listen to the signals that are coming from your mind and diversify what you're doing as much as you can. I'm so excited about teaching. I'm 
so passionate about it. But teachers in my country aren't getting that much salary, and we have a, this real serious severe problem because uh, almost none of the students want to go into teaching. So, what would you say to these people? I mean, there's a couple of different problems in play there. So, on an individual level, I think the most important thing is to allow children and young people to identify their own passions and not try to guide them in any direction. Uh, I think this is one of the reasons why Montessori schools are a wonderful thing, is that instead of trying to group you into, you, you're, you're an English guy, you're a science guy, you're a history guy, it's just let them discover their own passions and encourage them to work and be productive in those passions. You, like I said, you'll be so much more productive if you're working in something you're passionate about. I think that's a separate issue from the economic problem of why are people not being paid enough in X and Y industry, which will be to do with regulatory and economic factors in a given context. So that's a separate problem of, of the pay issue, and it might be that going abroad is, is the better solution to work in a particular field in some countries, and it might be that you, you have to make a trade-off when you're choosing a job between doing the thing you value most and earning enough to survive. I, I, I would have loved in the past to just like be paid to go around taking pictures of things and like do, just doing what I do as a hobby, being paid for it, but it's completely unrealistic. No, nobody's ever going to want to do that. But at the same time, I, I, there's work I could do that could earn me probably quite a lot more than I am doing if I went into some kind of consultancy management role that I wouldn't find fulfilling. So there, there is a trade-off, and it's not a compromise. Like, it's, you shouldn't compromise your values and do something you hate or something you dislike in order to earn money. But you do need to find the, the rational trade-off between actually being able to make a living. And also, it may be a case that you need to temporarily do a different job to build up the money to then do the job you want to do. Like I said, I think that's a completely rational trade-off because even then, you're doing the job you dislike in the service of your ultimate goal. Like if you're writing a book and you do a job on the side to earn the money to write the book. It's, as long as the work, whatever the work is, is in service of your goals in the long term, then it's valid and valuable. I think the problem is when you're doing something that you dislike and you think that's going to be the permanent situation and you're doing it in spite of the fact and, and not serving what you actually want to do in life. Is that helpful? Or yeah, yes, to some extent, yes. Leopold has such a booming voice that we can hear him anyway. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, okay, question on, uh, so I, I've been an entrepreneur for the past 10 years, and when I sit and think about my life, one thing uh, is that I miss, I miss working with someone who's so good that I want to be inspired by the right? So I said, I wish I could go find a job, but not just because I want to uh, work in that industry specifically, but I want to work with that person, right? Like, uh, I want to have a Lead or romantic, like, see job, that's it. Okay. So, how important do you think uh, in life, uh, in our career, is to find that mentor, that leader, even if that's not the specific job I want to work on for the rest of the time? Yeah, I do think that's quite important, and I've actually had several people like that in my life. I, I, there are different kinds of mentors. You, you can have mentors that are well, you can have role models in a given role. Like, you, you can say, I want to write books like this guy does, or I want to give talks like this guy does. And you can have value mentors, people whose sense of life, whose way of thinking, like you talked about your father in your presentation, like people whose mentalities are, are worth copying, or worth, not copying, but like worth emulating and learning from. So, yeah, I think that's really valuable, and I think there are different kinds, and you should have probably more than one. I actually skipped the part of my talk by accident where I was intending to talk about my, the jobs I've had since I discovered objectivism. And um, I, I had a couple of mentors in those different jobs, and um, I'm lucky enough to have Craig as one now, who's, who's both a mentor in lifestyle and a mentor professionally. But before that, I, I had a, an excellent boss in, in when I was doing the urban planning work, who just had an extremely benevolent and happy attitude to the work he did and took it very seriously. And, and that was, at the same time, I had another mentor who was chairman of a think tank who was a mentor for my intellectual work. So I had two different people who were serving those roles, and now I've got 
a number, actually, but you know, one in particular who does both. So, yeah, it's incredibly valuable. It's also, it's also helpful to find people who recognize your potential and see the right way to develop it for you. And for me, that's been Annie, who's, who saw, like, eight years ago, um, who just at a dinner just clearly identified that, you know, I, I could do something more if I had the opportunities and started helping me get those opportunities. So, you know, there, there are several different kinds of mentors. And somebody said yesterday, you know, uh, what, what, who you know is terribly important, or I know a guy is terribly important. Like, it is really, really valuable to make the right connections with the right people. And I wouldn't be here today. Well, actually, two things I'll make points I'll make quickly. One, I wouldn't be here today if I hadn't met the right people and put myself in the situation to meet those people. So selecting the people you hang around with and what, what Brian Rose calls upgrading your peer group. Like stand, be with the kind of people who you want to be like. Uh, don't just be with the people you happen to meet through accident of, of happenstance. Try and select your peer group. That's one thing. And then can I remember the other thing? Maybe I can't remember the other thing. There was another point I was going to make there, but it's gone out of my head now. But it's really important to select the people you hang around with and, and choose the right crowd to be with, and that will help lift you up in the long run. Thank you. Oh, yeah, I, mean, I think they can hear me. Thank you for the session. It was really useful, really interesting. Uh, I wanted to ask, uh, how do you balance still being very passionate about what you do after you've started monetizing it too much. For example, in my case, uh, I'm a, a part-time singer, uh, so, but like currently I, I have gigs only like a few times a month and sometimes I just don't have it for the whole month. Uh, but I can't help but think if it was something I was going to do every day, uh, it becomes like kind of like too much or especially from the physical side of, of things. Uh, so do you give any advice for such situations where you're really pursuing a dream but you know that it comes with the cost of actually losing the purpose and losing your passion for it if that becomes something you do every day? Yeah, um, that sounds to me and I, I, won't, I, not, I don't know your situation in detail so I, you know, don't take this as being the case but that, that sounds like is a situation where that's maybe more of a hobby than a career. Like, um, if because I being a touring musician is an extremely strenuous job, where, where you're flying every day and and doing this energizing performance on stage and dealing with all of the agents and fans and all that kind of stuff as well. So it, it's a very taxing role, and you have to be extremely passionate and active in it. And if you look at real musicians, that those who are have an amazing time, and those who aren't end up falling into addictions and all those sorts of problems and fights and everything. So it, it, that's the kind of role that you, ha if you're going to do something like that, you, the passion has to be enough to overcome that and, and make that worthwhile. And if it isn't, then it probably isn't your calling. But it, it may be something that you just end up doing on the side. Like, if you want, and that's perfectly valid. Like, I, I have things like that. Like, um, I'm still interested in architecture and planning, and I do a little of that on the side from time to time just to, enjoy and same with my music I just do a little bit of guitar here and there because I enjoy it and I, I would totally go and do a show if I had the time but I wouldn't want to do it day in day out it would just be completely overwhelming and and that just doesn't fit with my personality type so it go back to that exercise of you know, you have infinite money what would you do and if do you really think in detail that you would play songs five days a week in front of an audience, um, do you think you could live with that? Would you enjoy it? Or is there something else you would choose to do in that situation and perhaps that other thing? But I totally don't want to disencourage you from doing singing. If, if you enjoy singing and you're good at it and it's rewarding for you, doing rewarding things like putting on our conference is hard work and it's an enormous amount of exertion. But just maintain that balance of resting enough because if the exertion is so much that it nearly kills you and you're not going to enjoy the product, then it's not worth it. So... Only you can do that work of figuring out if the value outweighs the cost or not. First, I want to thank you for your inspirational speech uh, and uh, just for summarizing. Uh, what is the key criteria uh, for separating work from job? Or maybe key criteria? Um, so a job is one kind of work. 
So they, they don't need to be separated so much as understood correctly in context. So if a job is the way that, well, so as I said, work is productive effort. It's effort that results in some kind of product. So if, if a job is doing that for you, if it's serving your values and achieving your goals, then it's work. I, I, I would separate the two from in two ways. Firstly, that there are other kinds of work. So your concept of work should include things you produce at home if you write books, make models, you know, do knitting, whatever kind of productive thing you do in your spare time is also a form of work. Cleaning the house, that kind of stuff, walking the dog, whatever, that's all work. Um, so it's have that broader concept of work. And then with a job, make sure it's in line with your values and it's serving your values. And if it is, and if it's productive for you, then it's work. And if it isn't, then it's drudgery. It's, it's just mindless activity. And that, that's the thing to avoid is where is the situation I see so often where pe yeah, people are producing wealth for themselves, but then they're not happy. So they're not ultimately serving their values. And I often ask people who, who say things like, oh, I hate my job and I just want to rest all the time. Like, you know, what, what is the purpose of your work? Why are you working so hard if you're not enjoying your life the rest of the time? The point of making the money is to enjoy your life. So yeah, it's, it's work is work when it's serving your values and actually building a, a good life for yourself. And if it's not, then that's when it's fallen outside of that sphere. Yeah, they, they overlap. I think, I think a job is a concept within work. They're not, they, they partially overlap. A, a job may or may not be work, and work may or may not be a job, but they, they can be one and the same thing. success stories of people who, who have done that, who have realized in their 40s or 50s that they've been going down the wrong path and have changed and have become actors or musicians or something and achieved great success. So, no, if, if you come to the real... Um, excuse me. <clears throat> if you come to the realization that your work, even if... No matter how old you are, that your work or your life has been not in service of something you actually care about, try and put that right. Like, there, there is... There is no point giving up and just carrying on. And I think some people do that at a tragically young age. They, they do it in their 20s or 30s. They just say, oh, this is my life now. I'm just going to do this forever. And uh, you know, I'll be an accountant nine to five, and I'll never do anything meaningful. And, peop and people have this tendency of seeing. This is one of the things that objectivism helped me realize. When, when you see rich people and successful people, there's a mindset that that's them, and we're us. And, it's two different worlds, and you're either born into one or born into the other. It's very deterministic. And the truth is that if you have the right attitude and the right mindset, you can travel between the two. Like, they got there somehow. So, yeah, if you get to that point, then absolutely stop and change. But do it gently and properly. It's a bit like deregulating the economy. You can't just do it overnight, shut everything off, and it'll be a disaster. You, you need to say, okay, here, what's my plan for transitioning to where I need to be? What skills do I need to learn? What precautions do I need to take? Do I have enough savings to start a business or whatever? Or do I need to do some kind of phase transition? But, um, but yeah, just absolutely never go along and accept second best. Or always try and do that process of identifying what you really care about and pursuing it. Thank you. I think 
think I can speak without the mic. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just want to actually, it's not a question for you, sorry, but um, just to cooperate on this, I think uh, I've changed careers several times in my life and always sometimes started from scratch and just been very passionate about something and started and, or done several things at the same time. But don't underestimate, and this is not, this, this is very selfish of me because I, uh, that you, I recommend that you take a second uh, thought about your teaching career. There is such a big need for teachers who are passionate and good and don't underestimate the power that you have as an individual teacher. You might be surrounded by mediocre or whatever, and that goes for anything you do. You could be surrounded by mediocre, but you are an individual. You can stand out. You can, you can, if you're so passionate about teaching and you know that that's something that you want to do, you have the means to stand up and do I mean, I've seen that with all my kids. They have had teachers who were unique, you know, I, I, not all of them, definitely not, but there were some teachers who actually, and I've had those myself, one math teacher, was just so passionate and, and knew exactly how to reach the kids. So don't just change careers unless you think this is futile. Change uh, your way of thinking first about what, how you can stand out. And Rand kind of, I think it's in Andrew's talk. No, it's in, it's in Anthem, right? She talks about be the best uh, street sweeper you can. You know, be the best at what you 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 want to do or can do, and uh, you will stand out. And you can you don't underestimate how much you can change the system of people around you or at least affect the kids that you're teaching which is going to be huge yeah but that's that's the, the best part of that job because uh, for me most of my colleagues think oh it's useless but uh, in my teaching in my work uh, i try to be out of the mold you know to break the mold and i see that kids like that they want something new, they want passion, and that's something that drives me to Exactly, that inspires you to be even yeah. better, and, and, to stand, and, and some, at some point, you touched upon opportunity. You need to be outstanding to, 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 to get opportunities, because yes. people are not going to notice mediocre, they will notice that it's someone who's so good that they stand out. So. I'll, I'll just add as well, sometimes it's really important to identify the problem if you're unhappy in your work, and sometimes it's not that you're not serving your values, it's that the environment you're in isn't conducive to doing that. So it might just be that you need to go to a different school or a different place, a different environment. Maybe you want to teach as an as a individual tutor for specific students instead of in a school setting or something like that. So yeah, oftentimes... It's, it's important not to give up a good thing because there's bad people around you or you're in a bad environment. It might just be that you need to move within the profession as well. They want to see their kids doing the things they wanted, uh, and today we don't have uh, interest. You said the child was asking the question, not giving the answer, so it puts the child down. He's not interested anymore. Is there any advice, or is it possible to change mentality of parents, like uh, to help them understand that it's important to push their kids to uh, search on their own, or to help them? until a certain point or level? Um, so I, I try not to give too much parenting advice because I've not done it myself, but um, I, I can speak to the fact that I, I am doing the kind of thing I do today and I have the interests I have today because of my father's encouragement of my interests. And he, he had the approach of... He, he was a very active-minded person as well, and he, he was very interested in Egyptology and Western cinema and that kind of thing and theater, and he gave me those interests, but he just said, do what you like, and, and so I 
naturally became an av avid train enthusiast. So he, um, so he encouraged that, and he took me up and down to railway museums and on, on flights and all that kind of thing. So what he did, uh, but I also got some of his interest from him as well. So the problem is that the parents are also not active-minded. It's not, I mean, it, it, Craig's written a great article, um, Craig and his wife wrote a great article on how to raise a life-loving child, which I strongly recommend if you want specific advice about parenting style. But I think a large part of it is the parents having the right sense of life and attitude as well. So the best thing we can do is encourage the people around us to be creative and curious and try and um, reawaken that sense of life in people, even if they didn't have it from their childhood. Um, there's a really, as an expression I quite like, came from Doctor Who originally, which is, there's no point being grown up if you can't be childish sometimes. I think it's really important to retain and encourage that childish sense of curiosity and optimism, even as we become adults, and encourage it in the adults around us. And it's hard to do this with people, and it's taken me years to achieve a, a, a significant change in even my, some of my closest friends to encourage them to be more curious and active-minded about their lives. But if the parent is, then they'll encourage the child to be. I, I think the problem most of the time is that children, almost by human nature, grow up uh, or are born and start out very curious and very active-minded. And then you get a, par a parent or two parents who aren't. And that's the sense of life of the parent imprints on the child. And, they restrain it for that reason. So I don't think it's so much of a parenting approach problem as the sense of life of the parent being wrong in the first place. So the best thing we can do is just try and encourage people to be curious themselves and encourage that mindset, and then also fix the school system, because a lot more of this problem is schooling than parenting, I think. Okay, uh, I want to return to the term of work-life balance. I completely agree that it's a wrong term, but I wonder if it's so popular, especially in social media, maybe something is wrong also with like workplaces. And if you are an objectivist who is looking for a new job, for example, what are the red flags, red flags you should pay attention to? Um, I'm not sure what you mean. I mean, uh, for example, uh, if you're looking for a new a job and you're uh, going through this uh, you know, interview process, what the things you should pay attention about the company? Yeah, um, yeah I, well, I think this is true for anyone, really. Uh, is in terms of a specific company, I mean, the most important thing to do is identify your values and pick a, core, a type of work that fits your values first. But in terms of a company or the people in the company, you look for rationality. Look, look for a, a sensible, rational approach to things. I, I've had interviews where... I had one interview where I, kn I knew for a fact that I only got the job because I went to grammar school. Uh, and I saw the guy's eyes perk up when I said what school I went to, and his whole attitude changed. I thought, you're just literally giving me a job because I went to a certain school. Like, that doesn't seem like the right kind of environment to be in. So, yeah, like, but you, you, there's relatively little you can get from a, a one meeting of a person. Like, just try and get a general sense of if they seem to be rational, if they seem to be kind. You know, avoid the little Hitlers who run their companies like sort of despots. But... I, I'm not sure I can give a terribly helpful answer to red flags with companies. It's much more about the work and the values than about the organization, I think. Um, you, you often won't know until you're in it if it's a, uh, if it's a good... I mean, you, there's, there's certain obvious things, like look for unethical practices and you know, consider what, what it is the company does and how, what their track record is. Like, I wouldn't go and work for a company that I know is Chinese-owned or something like that, but... Yeah, there's, there's obvious stuff, but beyond that, it's a lot of it you won't know until you're there. It's, it's, you, you can only learn so much ahead of time. All good? <laughs>